Our second reading is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 to 16, and that's on page 1501 of the Church Bibles. Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 1. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Tony. Please keep your Bibles open there. Um, these are familiar words for us, salt and light. For many of us, it's an image that we've heard many times. Some of us have grown up in church, and, and so it's not unusual to hear these words for us. And we've probably heard many times what salt means and what light means. And so some of what I say today will probably be very familiar to you, and that's okay. If it is and it's an encouragement to you to to press on, great. Um, If it is something completely new to you and leaves you wondering, how exactly am I to be light and salt? How can I be like a city on a hill? Uh, Well, I look forward to having that conversation with you. This is about authentic Christianity. I think the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5, 6 and 7 of the Gospel of Matthew, these words of Jesus help us to understand what it is to be an authentic Christian, to be, to truly be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so it's good for us to read it, study it, challenge ourselves, how am I living against this standard? Now there are two ways that we can learn how to be a Christian. There might be a few more, but there are two main ways. One of those is to sit and study. That's how many of you have completed your degrees, you've sat, you've studied, you've done what needed to be done so that you could learn. Uh, Psalm 19 that Richard read earliest helps us with that. When it says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eye. And so you do well to sit and to study the law of the Lord. But another way that we can learn, and again, many of you, when you've completed your degrees and you've gone out to work in that field for which you've studied, you've learned that um, actually university doesn't teach you everything. Because the other way you learn is you learn from others. You learn from what others are doing and from how others are living. You learn from the way that they act and don't act, from the way they react and do not react, from what they make a priority and what they don't make a priority. And so for Christian people, we should be able to to watch each other and see how people respond, react, live, and that can help us to know how we too should respond, react, 
live uh, in my years in youth ministry. One of my real big pushes was the importance of intergenerational ministry so that young people could see middle-aged and older people and understand that, okay, that's what a 40-year-old Christian looks like. That's what a 60-year-old Christian looks like. That's what a 90-year-old Christian looks like. I want to encourage you to read biographies, um, children in particular. I know Lauren does a fair bit of that. Uh, To read biographies about people who have lived for Jesus. You can learn from others in that way. And as you're doing that, as you're seeking and beginning to learn from others, you'll begin to see what it means to be authentic and Christian. To be authentic Christian. Sometimes it helps you to see what people are doing and recognise, I don't think that's Christian. That's not authentic Christian. And so having these two things is helpful. An authentic Christian reflects Jesus. So when we talk about being the light of the world, when Jesus says, you are the light of the world, it's not because we just, we are everything, it's rather that we reflect who Jesus is. Uh, Does anyone remember the Paul Coleman trio? Three hands, excellent. Uh, Their song, uh, The Sun, the Stars and the Moon, uh, used this line, which I think is brilliant. I want to be the moon because it reflects the sun. I don't want to be the star that shines on everyone. And for a Christian, I think that's a helpful image. I want to be the moon. I don't want to be the sun. I'm not the sun. I reflect the sun. I don't want to be the star that shines on everyone. So when Jesus says to his disciples who have gathered and they've heard his Beatitudes, these blessings, which interestingly and uh, scarily ends with blessed are the persecuted, blessed are you when you are persecuted. He then goes on to say, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And so as we think, apply those words to what it is to be authentic Christian, um, there are two things that I would say to you today. Uh, here's what you can do and here's what you can't do. And what you can do is to be tasty. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. Now, it's been my uh, privilege. I'm not sure what a better word is, but uh, I know two dietitians pretty well and neither of them say good things about salt. (laughs) But I had a chance to talk to Jackie this week. Uh, Is there anything good about salt? And Jackie said yes. With a whole lot of caveats attached to that. (laughs) Jackie tells me that for some aged people who have lost a sense of taste and aren't eating much, adding some salt to enhance the taste will help them to start eating again. There is a very positive benefit to salt Um, in that way. We'll come to the other side of it a bit later. But um, there's something positive about that and it's that positive aspect that I think Jesus is picking up here. So be tasty. Enhance the taste. Enhance what's going on around you. And let me encourage you to do that when it's easy. To do that when it's easy. Don't wait until it gets hard to then try to be salt of the earth. Do it when it's easy. And when is it easy to be the salt of the earth? When you are surrounded by others of like mind. When you have other people around you with whom you share a common faith. So, for our politicians, for our Christian politicians and Christians who work in the, uh, in the political sphere, the political world, It's good for them to get together, to meet together, to pray together. Even if they belong to different parties, even if they have vastly different political views and understand how things can work out best, they can pray together and they can find strength together. To enjoy the fellowship of other Christians matters. So, 
for young people at university, Christian Union, AFES. Uh, these are really important groups. Power to Change is another. These are really important groups because you have the opportunity here to meet together with other Christian people to spur you on in what can be a pretty difficult place. We can embrace the opportunity to serve together. And there are ways that churches do this which isn't well promoted and that's okay. And there are ways that we can embrace the opportunity to serve together, either as a congregation ourselves or by joining in with what other churches are doing. You can do that this year. You can choose to be a part of a thing called Winter Shelter. You can sign up, work with other Christian people, not, exclu not exclusively, but this, this is based in churches. You can work, volunteer for Winter Shelter to help people who are homeless in our district. You can talk to Maria about that if you want to know the value of serving in winter shelter. When it's easy, do it. Because it'll get harder. And when it does become harder, then I want to urge you, do not become tasteless salt. You have this, this image of Jesus, uh, what's it good for when it loses its flavour? It's no good for anything. Just throw it out and to be trampled by people. And what do I mean? What does Jesus mean here? Well, there's a lot that Jesus says here, um, but I would translate it like this. Don't become so much part of the crowd that no one can see any difference in you at all. That, in fact, you're no different to anyone else. You're just like everybody else. Don't become foolish. So Jackie tells me there are also bad effects from salt. And most of us know that. Many of us have grown up with the, the, the message of don't eat too much salt. What was the, the jingle? Eat less salt, eat less fat, eat less sugar. Anyway, if that's ringing the bell in my mind anyway. And most of us probably know what it's like when we've bitten into something that just has too much salt on it. So don't, don't try too hard to be salt and end up being too much. And you probably know some Christian people like that. I've learned that the phrase loses its saltiness uh, actually means becomes foolish. So it could read, if the salt has become foolish, how can it be made salty again? And one commentator helps me to understand that when he says, Jesus was not teaching chemistry, but using a proverbial image. The rabbis commonly used salt as an image for wisdom, which may explain why the Greek word represented by lost its taste actually become, actually means become foolish. A foolish disciple has no influence on the world. A foolish disciple has no influence on the world. So, be tasty. The other thing that Jesus says is about being light of the world, so I want to say to that, be seen. Be seen. You are the light of the world. A town built on a, on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Be seen. Now, you know, many of you know, I used to ride a motorbike. And if I was riding at night or in the evening, I would always put on a high-vis vest. I hated it. It made me look like some fool in a high-vis vest. <laughs> but it was important because I wanted to be seen. I wanted to be obvious. So, again, to you, when it is easy, be seen. One of the great things about being a part of a Christian group is that you are not alone you have the opportunity to meet with others, indeed to do things together, to be unhidden. I was talking with a guy a few weeks ago 
Um, he's not a church, not a church goer, but he lives out in Waverley. And he made the comment about City Life Church. That you drive down High Street Road on a Sunday morning, and their car park is just full, overflowing. It's a it's a huge church. I was able to say to him, so when you hear the people talking about the church is dying, it's declining, it's fading away. Well, just keep in mind, there's a car park there that's full every Sunday, a few times every Sunday, and on Saturday as well. See, when it's easy, make the most of that because it will get harder. And when it does get harder, well, perhaps you need to ask the question, can I remove the barrier? Jesus said, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house, as Anne illustrated for us. When it gets harder to let your light shine, can you do something to remove that barrier? Is there something you can do to help, uh, to help that light to shine brighter? I read this week, um, this lovely illustration. Um, just, just recently, this, this guy writes, I attended a great uncle's funeral. He died just a month before his 100th birthday. I learned that he was a fluent Italian speaker. This intrigued me. He learned Italian so that he could speak to the Italian prisoners of war he guarded. Interestingly, he did this because he felt sympathy for them. His faith was important to him and learning a language was an expression of that faith and compassion for those he had been fighting against. What a lovely way to be light to the world in a dark place. What a lovely way to try to remove that barrier so that he could be light in that world. I wonder, is there a creative way that you can be light in this darkness? Maybe there's something uh, you can do just differently that can be a light in a dark place. But strangely enough, one way that you can be light is just by being consistent, just by turning up. You can be a light for the world. You can be a light to your friends by picking up the rubbish at the end of the day. There was a, a big Christian music concert festival in Ballarat uh, when we lived there, and one of the things that was mentioned in the newspaper about that was the way that um, these Christians just tidied up after themselves. They left the university looking clean. I don't know if the crowds at the MCG have always done that. (laughs) The other thing to do is to glorify God and that this should be our motivation, our desire. Uh, In the same way Jesus says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So I want to say to you, make this a foundation. Make this thought a foundation for your lives. And so to our children here, I want to say to you, make it a foundation of your life to glory to God, that your life will bring glory to God. Some of you belong to St. Andrew's Christian College and that's the the motto for that school, glory to God. So children, you you can grab hold of that now. But it's not just children. All of us can grab hold of that and if we've drifted from that, we can come back to it. We can determined to move towards that, that my life exists to glorify God. Stephen McAlpine in his book, Being the Bad Guys, uh, which is a great title and an interesting book, uh, just makes this simple comment, start out faithful. Start out faithful. Let that be your trajectory wherever life takes you. So whatever opportunities you have, whatever business opportunities you have, whatever relationship opportunities you might have, whatever friendship, work, whatever it might be, my foundation is to glorify God. 
Now here, it's, uh, here in our church, we have those core values for us. To be God-focused, Christ-centred, spirit-enabled, biblically faithful, family-oriented, community-engaged. This is what we are and what we are aiming to be. And we want those core values to influence what we do so that when someone's reading the history of the Heathmont Presbyterian Church 100 years from now, they'll be able to look back and say, we can see how this was being lived out. There's a few Old Testament characters that stand out for me. And they stand out because they were young men who grew to be heroes, I call them, because their core value was faithfulness to God. Think of Joseph uh, in Genesis chapter 37 to 50. Joseph was sold by his brothers into slavery, into a foreign land. And yet his integrity, uh, <laughs> he became a man, a man of great influence and faithfulness in a foreign land. Daniel was captured as a young man, taken to Babylon, where he faithfully served God and the local government. Samuel, with a praying mother, but he was left in the care of a high priest who had got a lot of things wrong, but he became the great prophet and leader of his time. The core value of glory to God had a huge impact on their lives, who in turn had a huge impact on their era. Now, most of us will never be recorded as Joseph or Daniel or Samuel have been recorded. Our lives will generally fade into the mists of time. Might be remembered by our family. Uh, we might be remembered by or for a couple of things that we've done. But wouldn't it be great to be remembered as, you know, he did this thing or she did this thing. But what drove that was desire to glorify God. Jesus says to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. You are. And if you are this, be this. You are salt, so be salt, be tasty. You are light, so be light, be seen. That you can do. But what you can't do, what you can't do, and there are two things here. Firstly, you can't control how people will respond to that. The desire is that they will see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. We want that. That's what motivates us, that they will see us and not us, but they will see Jesus. One of the great concerns for many people in ministry is that we actually get in the way and that people look at us rather than seeing Jesus and we just want to get out of the way. Uh, will they praise your Father in heaven? Well, we hope and pray that they will. Or will they persecute you for righteousness? Will you be persecuted for righteousness because you are being salt and light? Because you are making a difference and you are visible? Now, a few years ago at the assembly, uh, Doug, Professor Douglas Milne was preaching and preaching about being persecuted for our faith. And he encouraged us. He said, this will happen. This will come. And in our society, we can expect it. But instead of preaching fear and pushback, he said, let, let us see these persecutors as our mission field. Let us see those who will persecute us as the people we can witness to. And it was a beautiful message. We cannot control how people respond. The other thing we cannot and must not do is to abandon God's law. And so if you look ahead to the next little section of the Sermon on the Mount, you will see uh, what Jesus has to say about that. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. And we can fall into the trap of thinking, I'm going to be a salt and light to the world. Uh, and I'm, what does that look like? I'm just going to do anything and... It'll, I'll just be nice. But Jesus gives us some guidelines to say, I haven't come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus didn't abandon the law of God, and nor should we. So here's the example that I want to give. And I do this with some trepidation. 
But a couple of years ago, at the Midsummer uh, Festival Parade in St Kilda, which is LGBTQI celebration, a church marched there under a rainbow banner. And I think they would have done that because they were seeking to be salt of the earth and light to the world. And I get it, but I think, but Jesus told us, I haven't come to abandon the law of God. And it seems like you are. Be salt, be light, but don't abandon God's law. And so finding that, that balance. At times can be tricky, I get that, but don't give that up. We, Jesus didn't give up God's law, and we, what do we do? We reflect Jesus. I want to be the moon, because it reflects the sun. Don't want to be the star that shines on everyone. And we are the light of the world, only because Jesus is the light of the world. And he says that about himself in John chapter 8. So you are the salt of the earth. So be salt. Be tasty. You are light of the world. So be light. Be seen. Now I said earlier there are two ways to learn to be an authentic Christian. One is to sit and study and Psalm 19 points us in that direction. The other is to learn from others. To read biographies. In doing this, learn what it is and and live it out. Let your light shine, the light of Jesus. But if you don't yet have the light of Jesus in you so that you can reflect that, then ask for it. And you can do that just where you are or you can come and talk with me with a cup of tea and I'll help you. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. You are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. So let's be that. Let's pray. Our loving Lord God, our Saviour. Oh, how we want to shine brightly for you. How we want to be an influence in our society. A society that seems uh, determined to dismiss and disdain the influence of Jesus and the influence of Christianity. So Lord, I pray that you'll help us in our time, in our generation, in our place. Help us to be what you've told us we are. Help us to be salt. Help us to be light. Help us to be unhidden. In all of that, Lord, Help us, please, to glorify you and you alone. In the name of Jesus, our loving Saviour. Amen and amen.